Well, just wait till the end with the applause. So yeah. thanks, <laughs> thanks for the um, um, uh, for the invitation. Also, thanks for the introduction. So today, I would like to talk to you about Prader-Willi syndrome, and this is an old depiction from the. Uh, 16th century about people that have Prada Vili. Philip II of Spain, the guy who sank the Spanish Armada, he had a collection of like weird people. And this is called La Monstrua Vestida, and this is like Monstrua uh, Desnueda. It's the same girl, and uh, you see here in the naked girl what the phenotype of Prada Vili is uh, short, pale skin, obese, and then you see it better in the original. She has a bread in one hand and grapes in the other hand the inability to reach the tighties. So these people can never stop eating, and it's, uh, this disease is characterized by then subsequent obesity and metabolic syndrome. Um, I have basically four parts in the talk, so I'll give you a brief background of prada willi syndrome as a genetic disease uh, model for obesity, and then start talking uh, fairly superficial about uh, snow anase, and especially about CD box snow anase. I'm going, as you can see on my T-shirt, I'm going through RNA meetings for a long, long time, and snow RNAs, they were in the community referred to as uh, snore RNAs because everybody was falling asleep and snoring uh, when people gave the same talks uh, all in, over and over again. But uh, recently it turned out that these old dogs, and these are the best and the oldest characterized uh, RNAs, more than 40 years worth of studies, they do new tricks, and it's quite an it, it turned out to be becoming a quite an exciting field. I will talk about two snow RNAs in the Prada Vili critical region, and they are the they're the major contributors to that syndrome. One is snort 115, and this the loss of the snow RNA is responsible for the hyperphagia in Prada Vili uh, syndrome. And then this is this is all published, and then I talk about snort 116, which actually is also uh, uh, Matthews from uh, Debbie's lab showed this is not just one snow RNA, this is a cluster of at least six different bi uh, biological distinguished snow RNAs, and they regulate RNA stability and splicing, and together this creates this, this syndrome that you saw in the picture before. And they just have, because this is a department of nutrition, so the overall arching scheme for non-genetic forms of obesity is that uh, RNA stability contributes to obesity and there might be a feedback between what you eat in nutrition in terms of methyl groups that come in in forms of folic acid. They will modify RNA in terms of um, an AM6 modification and that leads to uh, different stabilities of, of messenger RNA. So the genetic readout from DNA in forms of messenger RNA is modified in a way by nutrients. And uh, this might be the, the backdrop of this uh, disease. So what is Prader-Willi syndrome? So here, this is, uh, these are two patients from, or two subjects from New York. This is a Prader-Willi kit that is untreated, basically. You see short hands, fairly obese, short stature, and this is a boy is called Sam. He has been uh, treated with growth hormone since uh, basically day one. And you see that they took care of the obesity and the um, uh, the, the length distribution. So PWS is an inherited disease, incidence 1 to 10,000, 1 to 15,000. It is caused by the loss of one allele of an imprinted genomic region. That means that only one of the alleles is active. This is the allele from the father. Uh, these are the genes on this allele. If you lose this allele, you get this disease. Uh, it's a syndrome, so it has m many manifestations. The most prevalent is the obesity. There is mild to strong mental, uh, uh, mental retardation that depends uh, heavily on the environment. Uh, behavioral problems, these people have a low threshold for, um, uh, for, for failure, uh, tend to have, uh, to have uh, temp temper tantrums, and there is uh, hormonal, uh, uh, lots of hormonal changes, so typical hypothalamic um, problems. Often they have, as you also can see, see here, they have fair skin. Uh, developmentally, there are very defined phases in the disease. You can, def you can uh, very precisely predict uh, what's going to happen. They are born with the inability to eat. They are, they are uh, supported by gavage feeding. Uh, they have um, low muscle tone at birth. And then around the age of three, these feeding problems turn into the opposite. They basically um, uh, start eating 
uh, incessantly and then uh, lose the ability to get satiety uh, after a meal. And that leads to this obesity shown here. Uh, the region has been characterized. There are several breakpoint clusters here um, that uh, generate the disease. And then you have a, a minimal um, um, repertoire of factors that are, that are caused this disease. These are five protein factors. Uh, knockout mouse shows that these protein factors are not the major contributors of the disease. And then there are these snow RNAs, uh, prominent are two classes of snow RNAs, SNORT-116 and SNORT-115. There's 47 copies of 115 and around 30 copies of SNORT-116. And loss of these uh, snow RNAs seem to be the major driver of the disease. I would like to emphasize this, that probably all these factors have to come together to get the full-blown uh, picture here. And then there's uh, single snow RNAs here that are not well understood. So these arrows here shown, uh, shown here are micro deletions. If you lose this part of the cluster, uh, you get a Prada Vilio phenotype. So as I said, here's a loss of CD box. No one is contribute to pre-WS, uh, but I say contribute. This is a, the latest patient reported with a loss. This is this cluster here. He lost only SNORT-116, and he looks fairly normal. You have to be a trained clinician to figure out that this person has uh, prader willi sy syndrome. Notably, this person, you see he is slim, uh, relatively slim. He, is not, uh, he doesn't have hyperphagia because he is ineffected in this cluster of SNORT-115. And this is a contrast here to the classical full-blown picture of PWS. So the loss of CD box snow RNAs are critical for prader willi syndrome. Uh, so what are, what are CD box snow RNAs? I would like to drive home two major or three major points. First of all, they're highly expressed. So you all heard probably of U RNAs, yes, U1, U2, U3 RNAs. And what's, what this is is basically is that with Stone Age methods, you can isolate these nucleic acids. This was before people knew that there's RNA. And then this nucleic acid had a base called uh, uh, uracil or uridin, and this gave the name of URNA, urnas. So these were simply nucleic acid that had that had uh, uracil uh, inside, and then U3 was the third most abundant of these things. And this is one of this. This is the most abundant CD box snow RNAs. There are as many numbers of U3 molecules in a cell as a total number of uh, messenger RNAs. And this is just one of the 250 snow RNAs. So they're incredibly highly abundantly uh, expressed. That's number one. Number two, uh, they have been studied for a long time, for over 40 years, and they form uh, basically methylating complexes. And they, they send uh, methylation activity, 2 prime or methylation, to mainly ribosomal RNA, in humans only to ribosomal RNA. So they modify ribosomal RNA structure and as their function. Now, over the last couple of years, new functions were discovered. I show you some of the functions here. And this is, and this I show you the data. This is by the um, formation of non-methylating complexes. The enzyme that these no RNAs have is missing there. And then they get new functions, the change of alternative splicing and the change of messenger RNA stability. With three exceptions, all human snow RNAs is different in other organisms, like in yeast. With three exceptions, all human snow RNAs reside in an intron. And uh, they are released in the splicing reaction from this intron. And then they form a protein complex that is shown here. And this protein complex does two things. It, it acts as a scaffold for the, uh, for the um, formation of an RNP, so the RNA uh, uh, allows proteins to attach to this, uh, to this complex here. And this is one thing. And the second thing, it acts as a guiding machinery by uh, RNA-RNA base pairing. Uh, the target RNA, in this case a ribosomal RNA, is brought into the distance of here of an enzyme called fibrillarin that performs 2 prime O methylation. So this, this hydroxyl group gets an, a methyl group attached that changes the, uh, the um, structural requirements of the uh, of the of the RNA. So that's a classic picture that you find in textbooks of CD box snow RNAs. And then fast forward a couple of years, uh, this is based on NMR structures of Archaea, 
uh, snow on piece, so you have this uh, structure here. The snow arnie has a stem at the end that protects this arnie from degradation. Then there are two structures here that become important later. This is an, called an arnie kink that is made by these two elements, a C and a D box, and this comes in duplicates. There's a C and D box here, and C prime and D prime box here. They form an RNA structure, as the name said, that's a kink where the RNA makes a, sh a sharp turn in these three nucleotides. This kink is stabilized by a protein called 15.5 that defines this uh, RNA structure. And then there's uh, two structural elements as space holders, NOP58, NOP56, and they attach then at fibrillarin that performs this methylation here. This is a classical picture, and this is about, uh, has been shown experimentally only for something like five snow RNAs. The rest was deduced, and then there was a problem that about half of the 257 human snow RNAs don't follow these pictures. We don't have the targets. They're highly expressed, and the question is, uh, what is their function, and how is this uh, generated? So before we come to the function, I just want to give one more background information. This is based from U3 snow RNA um, that, uh, that showed this assembly uh, process here. So a typical snow RNA is, is sh shown here, encoded by an intron. Uh, there's a space requirement to the branch point in the, uh, in, in the lariat when this uh, s complex is formed. Uh, the lariat here after splicing is opened up. There's exonucleases that trimmed on the snow RNA. And the snow RNA has this, uh, in yellow this ends here that bind to each other that protects chopping down from exonucleases. So once you have this RNA uh, formed here, there is a protein complex formed by the RT2P uh, complex that contains a bunch of chaperones and already a bunch of the structural proteins that is loaded on this protein complex here. This is important for nutritional scientists like you because the RT2 complex is regulated by the mTOR pathway. So in, when a cell starves, this uh, system is essentially switched off and no snow RNAs are formed and no, subsequently no ribosomes are uh, modified. And then after further processing steps, you, uh, uh, all the proteins are loaded onto the, uh, onto the uh, RNA and you get then, oops, uh, you get then these, uh, these complex here. Um, most functions, and I want to stress this, are predicted experimentally only for five snow RNAs, this system, this O2'-O methylation and the, um, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the distance requirement was shown for on, only for, for these, these five snow RNAs. For the rest of the snow RNAs, what people did, they knew the modification side of the ribosomes and they kind of knew the sequences of the snow RNAs and then they kind of mapped it back. And that led to the dogma uh, that, uh, that I showed you in the, in the, in the classical function that snow RNAs work by guiding this protein complex and by forming this defined complex. However, when you look now with modern technology, and this is uh, work from Tolleves, David Tolleves' lab in, uh, in Scotland, uh, you see that, they, that these RNAs can form different structure and have probably forming different uh, guiding principles. So snow RNAs might have different uh, functions. So one of the, these functions became then clear when we started to study SNORT-115, which is one of the uh, snow RNAs mi missing in Prader-Willi syndrome. This is a cluster here. There's 47 copies of SNORT-115. With four exceptions, all these copies are identical. So you have uh, just a massive um, uh, I mean, multiplication of a, a snow RNA in these regions. And to, uh, to summarize the findings in 10 years of work, they regulate one splicing event. That is the physiological function. And this is the splicing of the serotonin receptor 2C that does two things. Number one, it makes voices, uh, generates voices in your head or makes them go away. Number two, it regulates food intake. Um, OK, so serotonin receptor 2C is uh, located on the X chromosome. And it undergoes alternative splicing here in the coding region. It has one exon, exon 5B. That, it, that is alternatively spliced. If this exon is skipped, you get a, uh, so if this exon is included, you get a full length receptor that undergoes, that is a seven transmembrane receptor that sits in, in, in part in the cell, cell membrane and can signal. If this exon is skipped, 
you get only three transmembranes. And for a long time, it was unclear whether this protein <laughs> is, uh, is um, uh, expressed or not. So we, we made an antibody. We showed it's expressed. And it's sitting only inside the cell. So this short protein sits only inside the cell and sits in the endoplasmic reticulum. And it's not just sitting there. It heterodimerizes C to C tails, uh, sorry, N to N tails with a full length receptor. And it basically keeps the full length receptor intracellularly. So the splicing ratio of these two proteins controls how much of the full length signaling receptors on the surface. In other words, the splicing, um, the splicing um, ratio of these two isoforms, so alternative splicing of exon 5b, controls the activity of the full length receptor. So this kind of functional identification came back like 10 years later. So when I came into the field, somebody called me up and said, we found the SNO RNA, the antisense box, the targeting box, is, has complete sequence complementarity to the, to the serotonin receptor. Uh, and then what does this mean? And we set up a system, which we were fairly good in the lab. We set up a co-transfection system. So we overexpressed a SNO RNA in the right context. It's called HB252, it's the old name for SNORT-115. Uh, it's after its inventors, Hüttenhofer, Brosius, Library 2, clone number 52, now known as SNORT-115. Uh, we overexpress the snow honey here, shown by this northern blot. And then what we see is shown by the increase of this band, a change in alternative splicing. So that means that the snow RNA uh, promotes inclusion of an alternative exon. It was the first demonstration of the non uh, methylating function of a SNO RNA. So SNO RNAs promote alternative exon inclusion. The question, this was published in 2006, and then for well, over 10 years we were banging our heads, what is the molecular mechanism? How can this work? And this was very difficult because we were trapped like intellectually in this picture of a SNO RNA forming these methylating complexes. And then one of the first dents in these pictures came from this experiment where we used a RNA's protection analysis, so you have an antisense RNA and you protect the, uh, the, the target RNA. RNA's protection gives you a one-to-one -one readout, so it's more precise than, let's say, um, real-time PCR. And secondly, you would see fragments. So this f here corresponds what has been published in the 2000 PNAS paper from the Rosius Hüttenhofer who discovered this in cropped out pictures. However, if you show the full protection, you get this picture. And what you see is that this is not one SNO RNA. This thing is processed into shorter RNAs that we call P SNO RNAs for processed SNO RNAs. And there's now plenty of evidence from RNA seq data that this is actually happening to a lot of uh, other SNO RNAs. So these, they, they don't form the full length SNO RNA, they form shorter fragments. That means they do form different protein complexes. And this is just a control that shows this on a northern blot analysis. Uh, second thing is we asked what kind of proteins bind to these SNO RNAs. So remember, in the canonical SNO RNAs, there's four proteins. There's 15.5, the kink, and then NOP48, uh, 56, and the methylase fibrillarin. We pulled this down, and we find completely different protein. Basically, HNRMP is a bunch of transcription factors, uh, and that's, a, that's about it. So we don't find in this biochemical isolation and association with fibrillarin. That means that this thing does not methylate other uh, RNAs, and it's not typical proteins for CD box uh, SNO RNAs. And this has implications, because if, if you think about the SNO RNAs as a protein complex, you can only substitute it by putting in the uh, expression cassette that has two exons and then an uh, the SNO RNA embedded into an intron for possible treatment. However, if this thing works as an RNA binding to different proteins, you could be able to substitute it by an oligonucleotide. And this is what we were pursued. Uh, so through variety of studies, we were convinced that the, the major target of SNOT115 is the regulation uh, of the serotonin receptor. And the serotonin receptor regulates food uptake uh, by activating POMC neurons in the arcuate nucleus. So POMC neurons, they express a uh, serotonin receptor. If, if the receptor there is activated by its ligand serotonin, it uh, basically makes POMC. 
uh, and then POM C is, is uh, modified to alpha uh, uh, MSH that uh, signals to the paraventricular nucleus. So this is the arcuate nucleus here, paraventricular nucleus a little bit above, and this gives us a satiety signal. So we speculated that this system is messed up or not working in Predavilli syndrome. So what we did then in order to see whether we can find a therapy is we uh, cloned this uh, receptor in, a, uh, in an ex expression system here and then uh, basically performed an oligo walk. So we synthesized different oligonucleotides. These are all 2 prime omethyl phosphothiates that have uh, show cell penetration and high stability. And we asked, can we find an oligonucleotide that has the same effect as SNOT115 in, in that it, it causes exon inclusion? And the winner was here, ex, uh, oligo5, that's shown here. You see when you add the oligo, you get this upper band indicative of inclusion of the exon. Um, I know there's some RNA structure people here. So this is the structure. This is very unusual. This is a structure of the pre-messenger RNA. So you have here this intronic region. Then starting here from the supply side, you have the uh, exonic uh, region. And this structure exists in vivo. And we know this because there are five editing sites here. And editing will occur only when there's a double-stranded structure. The way these oligos work, we do not fully understand it. Is they open the structure. And I want to point out that oligo 5 here just works opposite of the SNOT115 binding site. So we have now a molecule inside an atinmer that mimics uh, the, um, the, the, the effect of the uh, SNOW RNA, did some pharmacology with this, so the, it works in the low nanomolar ratio around, uh, with an IC50 of uh, 10 nanomolar, and importantly, we can label one part of the oligo with a fluorescent dye and follow its action. So this is one experiment uh, on cell biology. I told you initially that these two receptors uh, so the, 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 the alternative splicing makes, makes two RNAs, a, sh a shorter RNA and a longer RNA. They make, this RNA makes a truncated receptor, and this truncated receptor is intracellularly, and this full-length receptor sits on the cell membrane. This is a cell assay where we visualize the full-length receptor by GFP, and then here in this panel, we have a high ratio of truncated receptor to full-length receptor. This is in, shown here by this RT-PCR. And what you can appreciate, that most of the receptor is inside the cell. Because it's inside, it will not signal. However, when we add our oligo-5 and also SNOT or express SNOT-115, then we flip this ratio. Now you have predominantly exon inclusion here. Uh, with the oligo, you get the same with the SNOW RNA. And then the receptor is on the surface. Okay, and this is the quantification. So that means this these ratio of these splicing isoforms control the surface occupancy. And that's important because these receptors, the serotonin receptor, due to the, uh, the, the way it's set up, it signals without a ligand. It's, it's, it's uh, one, one of these receptors, and nature basically switches off that signal by putting that thing inside. However, as soon as it reaches the surface, it can then uh, signal, and this is controlled by the splicing ratio. And that's the defect in prada willi syndrome caused by loss of SNOT-115. So what about the in vivo situation? So uh, we, in, we injected then the oligo in the, the third ventricle by intracerebral, uh, by ICV an injection. Uh, oligo <laughs> is, uh, is labeled red. You see here rapid accumulation, also rapid clearance here in the arcuate nucleus. Uh, so we have entering of the oligo, and the oligo goes, I mean, this is true for all these oligos of this class, they, uh, they like to go into neurons. Neurons uh, take up these uh, nucleic acids very rapidly. Uh, we, after injection, then we measured a variety of things. One is splicing, it changes the splicing as, effect, as predicted, but it also changes food uptake. And this is here, uh, control oligo and no uh, oligo injection. I was surprised, actually, if you inject like a control oligo in mice, they don't stop eating. There's no change in it. Uh, however, if you put in oligo-5, uh, you get a 70% reduction that persists uh, for a couple of days. And then uh, this is a control in leptin ob um, deficient OBOB mice. Uh, we still have the effect showing that this goes over the uh, serotonin receptor. In the published data, there's also uh, knockout mice where it showed goes over the MC3 receptor. Uh, one thing that is really 
that I didn't uh, still I don't fully understand is that this is one of the few of the only examples of oligonucleotides that cross the blood-brain barrier. So for all therapeutic approaches, it's a big uh, problem. If you inject something in the blood, it does not end up in the brain. Oligo-5, if we inject it into the tail at a high concentration, it goes into the brain, shown here by the red staining, and also shown here by this uh, change in, um, in food uptake measured in metabolic uh, cages. So uh, this shows that we can substitute a snow RNA with this oligonucleotide because we understand the mechanism. This does not form a methylating complex. It's basically uh, the way it seems to work. It changes secondary structure of the target RNA. Uh, our substitution strategy is summarized here. So we have oligo-5. We drive formation of this particular RNA, and this causes surface uh, accumulation of the, uh, of, this, of the serotonin receptor. This signals then in the, in the arcuate nucleus and then uh, causes the tatiety signal. In prada patients with prada uh, uh, you don't have the transacting factors that make this RNA. You have too much of this RNA1, and basically you have a receptor. You make the RNA, but the, the, the protein uh, that is made from this, this RNA uh, is not reaching the surface, and that's the reason why these people don't get satiety. So that was SNORT-115, so what about SNORT-116? And this, um, starting with the first publication of a person with prada uh showing, indicating by this uh, error here, people focused on SNORT-116 because the, the, the dogma in the literature became that SNORT-116 causes prada -Villi. And this is not entirely true because that patient that was... Um, characterized by Art Baudet, it was basically somebody had endocrinological problems, slightly obese, they didn't know what to do, and this was in UT Southwestern, so they did an uh, exome sequencing of this person. And then only by the sequencing they figured this person has prada -Villi. He was not clinically uh, diagnosed with prada -Villi. And there's the, you know, our, our medical colleagues, they argue about the, whether this people are called prader willi syndrome or prader willi like syndrome. And I have colleagues that I really trust, like Dan Driscoll. He looks at the prader willi patients, and he says, by looking at a person, this is breakpoint 1 to breakpoint 5 of this phenotype cluster. So they're very, of years of experience, tells them this. And they could not pick these people out as prader willi So this is a caveat in the role of SNOT-116. Nevertheless, you lose this snow RNA, it gives you a phenotype. And the question is, what is the mechanism? So prader -Villi, in our book, it has 30 <laughs> copies in humans, and we can distribute them at, into at least six classes, probably more. So it's different to SNOT-115. There's no sequence complementarity to any other messenger RNAs that we can pull out of a computer, which makes it hard to understand what's going on there. So we were banging our head in one of these early uh, desperate attempts to understand what was going on. We simply overexpressed a copy of SNOT-116 mouse in a human cell, 293 cells that normally doesn't do it, and did uh, very primitive array analysis and fished out about 200 genes that changes gene expression. So we, we were expecting a change in splicing. What we got is a change in gene expression. Again, no binding site, no idea what the hell is going on. And then Marina, the postdoc on the project, went on to um, better to rich, richer waters in industry, and we, we published it. And then we were following up this project, and then one of these things that happens in science, um, that a colleague called me up, a uh, long-lasting uh, uh, long, uh, long friend, Ruth Sperling from Hebrew University. Ruth Sperling has been working on splicing for, for decades, and her claim to fame is that she developed a system that allows you to, um, uh, to separate nuclei under native conditions. I'm not sure whether anybody here works with nuclear extracts, dignum extracts. So in, if you make a dignum extract, or if you buy a dignum extract from people who know how to, work, to make them, they're made under denaturing conditions. You have a 420 millimolar salt extraction step in it, and that's denaturing. So in this uh, method here that is published, um, so we keep everything 150 millimolar. There is no hyperosmotic and whatever shock in it. 
several centrifugation steps. So what we get is the native stuff. Anyway, so we have a biochemical method under native conditions separating nuclei, uh, separating nuclei in something that is soluble, that's a supernatant, and something that is a pellet. Um, we look at the supernatant because it contains all the splicing factors which make snow onyx. And then Ruth, what she did, because it was in Hebrew University, they had a, um, they had a facility, she looked for small non-coding RNAs in the nuclear supernatant. And tons of snow onyx. About one third of all snow onyx are expressed in the in the soluble nuclear supernatant. We dig into it, and then what we find, and this is shown here, this soluble nuclear supernatant is free of fibrillarin. There's no methylase in it. So whatever these snow onyx are doing here, what one third of these uh, human snow onyx, they do not f they do not bind a methylase. That's they're not methylating. Uh, this was a detour that we took. This took about two years to understand what was going on. We, for reasons because I could figure out with a computer uh, putative targets, we zoomed in on SNOT <coughs> 27, and then SNOT 27 forms these methylating and non-methylating complexes. So it's one part of the SNO1 is associated with fibrillarin, probably methylates a, a ribosomal RNA, and the other part is not and the other part changes alternative splicing of these target genes here uh, as shown in this paper. So this gave us then, we, with this knowledge, we went back to SNORT116 and said, okay, we're going to analyze SNORT116 exactly the same way like we did with SNORT27. And first thing we did, we looked for expression uh, of these uh, 27 copies. Uh, so of, of, of these 30 copies, and there's in general, there it goes from, you go from the 5 prime to the 3 prime of the gene, they slightly go down. Uh, all these copies are processed as we published for found for mouse uh, earlier in these two uh, major, uh, major uh, classes here that indicate that they don't form predominantly these uh, methylating complexes. So one thing is, SNORT116 is not one SNORT RNA. These are, these are really different molecules with different functions. And the second thing is, if you look at the structure, and also I found this out, I have to confess, only after we had the biochemical data, this is a canonical snow RNA that is methylate, that would methylate a target here. SNOT116 has a abnormal box here, an abnormal C prime uh, box. It has an insertion of this G. This insertion of this G is conserved in all copies in all phyla. So I forgot to say, only uh, mammals with a placenta uh, express SNORT116. Like other, like birds or you know, reptiles, they, they don't have this, this, this snow honey. So lo and behold, the snow honey will not form a second kink here. And since there are uh, any structure people here, so there's more than a to, to a kink RNA structure, then there's the CND box. There's also what's called the canonical uh, C helix that is a base pairing of two um, Watson-Crick base pairing um, uh, structure. So this is messed up in SNOT116. So this, the canonical base pairing is essentially only one base pairing uh, between C and D box, a C on this side of SNOT116, and is completely missing uh, for the C prime and D prime box shown here. In a nutshell, that means that this kind of structure here is not forming for SNOT116. So the protein is missing the second loop, and the first kink here is um, severely weakened. All right. So with this in mind, Marina here started the, the project. So we separated cells that express SNOT116. And then what you find, there is about one third of the total RNA is expressed in the nucleus in the soluble fibrillarin free uh, nuclear supernatant here in cell lines that we make and also endogenous in these uh, neuroblast cells. In addition, we find the RNA in the cytosol as well. Uh, this was then, of course, you sent this to NIH and then, okay, the same grant. Like, like a good prostitute, you send the same thing to two study sections. One study section gave him a, gave him first shot a 17 percentile. The second study section triaged it with a stupid comment, snow RNAs are only in the nucleolus, because they're called snow RNAs, small nucleolar RNAs. 
and this was then triaged. And this is, I mean, it's like, what do you say about these people? Uh, so because of the study section com comments, we, we uh, repeated the experiments using a different protocol. And yes, uh, in this protocol, SNOT116 is in the cytosol and the control SNOT2, it's not. So uh, with this in mind, we performed a pull-down experiment. So we pulled down SNOT116 from the salval uh, supernatant, and we asked what kind of proteins are attached to it. And there's two classes of proteins. One is HNRMPs, and the other one are U2 components. So U2 is uh, the, one of the uh, things that change, that regulate, uh, that, that perform the splicing reactions. So this is all consistent with a model where SNOT116 forms an RNA that is stabilized by one kink and the protein that binds to it, and the rest of the RNA forms a loop here, like a tiny circular RNA, if you will, that is free to bind to other RNAs or free to bind to a subset of proteins, and this is also reflected by the fact that this SNO RNA forms very heterogeneous complexes, as we can see by glycerol centrifugation. Uh, so functional to figure out what SNOT116 is doing, we developed a method to knock down SNO RNAs because these are mainly nuclear RNAs. They don't necessarily shuttle into the cytosol. Normal SI RNA that works in the cytosol via DISA won't work, so we used a, uh, these Gapmer oligonucleotides that have an RNA and a, a part that flanks a, a central DNA part to knock down the copies. And the central DNA part, once it binds to an RNA, will el elicit uh, RNA's H activity, and we can knock down SNO RNAs. So for example, here's SNOT116. You knock them down, do the, the, uh, especially the RNA seq, 60 million uh, reads per, uh, per, pop, per pop, and do the bioinformatic analysis. And then two things comes out, and this was really amazing. So the first thing comes out, we see 54 microexons. So a typical cassette exon is 150 nucleotide longs reflecting the, uh, the, the chromatin localization of most exons. However, SNOT116 only uh, activates the usage of 54 microexons, and these are exons that are shorter than uh, 40 nucleotides in this, uh, or, or 50 nucleotides in, in this diagram here. Uh, secondly, there's only activation, and then when we look near the sites, we uh, all of a sudden binding sites start to emerge. None of these microexons change reading frames or anything, so they all keep the reading frame, and they're all just outside known of known protein domains. So we really didn't understand the biological function of these changes. But I want to remind people that uh, deregulation of microexons is associated with autism, and um, like. Predability people have autism uh, spectrum disorder like uh, phenotypes. Um, the, the, the most dramatic effect of SNOT116 knockdown was the expression of a change of expression of about 750 transcript. About uh, like around 80% of the transcript go up when you knock down SNOT116. So they will be going up in Predability. And this was the ver biological verification of the RNA-seq data, and then more validation physiologically in postmodern hippocampus. And then, together with Larry Reiter, we used human neuronal cells, so because they're not postmortem anymore, uh, made from patient dental stem cells. And you see here that these no RNAs, that these target genes are regulated. So we have a validated list of target genes. How does it work still? So first, we did RNA pull-down, didn't work, and then we used a protocol from that was developed by the Blankhoff lab, which is, that they call LIGA, where we basically cross-link cells in situ in the living cells with AMT, that's like a soralin for RNA people, and then pull down the RNA complexes, deprotein deep it, pull down the RNA complexes, and then capture SNOT116 complexes and do RT-PCR for target genes. And when you do this kind of expression here, all of a sudden we see the interactions. And we see the interactions only after crosslink. That means that they are transient. They're not really stable. So we have no target genes. We show binding. What is the function? And in order to zoom into the function, we had to concentrate on one model system. And the model system I choose was CFOS. And to be perfectly honest, I choose CFOS because this is the, the it's an immediate early gene, and that's the um, 
the poster child for RNA stability. Like every nucleotide in the C4 3 UTR has been assigned a function in RNA stability. So because of it's well studied, I choose it. And then what you write in grants is you choose it because uh, CFOS is in the cascade of the serotonin receptor. So when you, in the arcuate nucleus, when you turn on serotonin receptor, the signal is transduced via CFOS as a transcription factor, 2 pom c that makes a satiety signal. Um, the method we choose to analyze SNORT-116 was this hetero, was this uh, reporter system. The way it's set up, we have a globin reporter, and the globin reporter is under the control of the CFOS promoter. So the CFOS promoter is only uh, active in serum. So the way this works, you put this into cells, then you starve the cells that switches off the CFOS promoter. So none of these reporter genes is made. Then you add 20% serum. In 20% serum, the, the promoter, immediate early gene goes on immediately, and it automatically switches itself off through the MAP kinase pathway. So you get a small burst of the uh, promoter. It's a simple induction uh, pathway that works very well in 3T3 cells. The beauty of the thing is all our other uh, components are dependent on RNA polymerase. So we cannot work with actinomycin or, or some of these inhibitors. Plus, in this system, we do not poison cells. So what we did is then we, used, we swapped UTR. So we, we swapped the globin UTR with the CFOS UTR and put a bunch of transacting factors in it. And this shows various controls. And what you see here in this lines, if we have just uh, the snow RNA, uh, sorry, the, the reporter gene here with the, um, with the stabilizing protein, HUR, that thing is rock solid. However, when we put in SNORT-115 and one copy of the six copies we tested, we get this degradation. Uh, this was then repeated with a, a reporter that has no longer introns, that is le intrinsically less stable, and then in the presence of SNORT-116, uh, SNORT we, we are no longer able to see this reporter messenger RNAs, which is antagonized by uh, HUR. So this is all indicative of a model where the SNOW RNA binds to the UTR. So we have now the site of action narrowed down from a whole gene to about uh, 200 nucleotides of the, of the UTR and it kicks off a stabilizing factor, HUR. Uh, this model was tested then in this titration experiment where we increased the amount of HUR, uh, so or, or decreased the amount of HUR that we titrated in, and at the same time increased the amount of SNORT-116. And when you do this, the, the half-life of your messenger RNA goes down. So the model here is then that this SNOW RNA bind competes with factors binding to the, to the 3-PAM UTR, like this molecule HUR, and the SNOW RNA kicks HUR off. I forgot to mention HUR stabilizes messenger RNAs by binding to these AU-rich sequences. Uh, so the binding site for HUR is basically four U's in a row. Uh, these AU-rich sequences, they are found in many cytokines and many immediate early genes. Uh, there are typically rapidly degraded because there's a protein called tristretrapolin binding to it that attracts the, 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 um, the deadenylase, and then these RNAs get rapidly, uh, rapidly uh, destroyed. HUR prevents this tristretrapolin from binding and stabilizes these proteins. And now we think that SNOT116, by binding uh, in this mode, um, kicks off HUR, makes these RNAs then, again, unstable. Um, now, narrowing down the binding sites allowed us to identify the binding modes. So it, similar to a microRNA, there seems to be a seed sequence that we've seen before in splicing uh, uh, um, uh, uh, pa paradigms. And then there seem to be the rest of the snow, and it seems to kind of dangle around, and it can hit different parts of the RNA molecule. So we have selectivity only on a, so on a short uh, region here, and then the rest uh, can bind to different RNA, uh, RNA parts. Intrinsically, the way this RNA is, is, is set up, all SNO is because of the C and D boxes, they will hit AU-rich uh, sequences by base pairing here. Uh, binding site is also conserved between human and mouse. So this is the overall um, uh, model for SNOT-116. So this SNOT-116 makes non-methylating complexes that are active. 
They can act in the nucleus by kicking off the pressors near microaxons, leading to microaxon inclusions. And they can also kick off stabilizing proteins. And in the majority, they seem to be stabilizing proteins by uh, kicking off these proteins that make these RNAs less stable. The physiological function, and this is also part of a collaboration with Jeannie LaSalle when we compared our uh, data between uh, uh, human subjects and, uh, and, and our cellular data, seem to be that in general, SNOT116 decreases the half-life of uh, immediate early genes. So immediate early genes are turned on in neurons all the time when you think or when there's neuronal activity. They rapidly go up, but they also have to rapidly go down. And this rapidly going down is facilitated by SNOT116. If you don't have it, these RNAs linger around. And some of these of our target genes are actually involved in circadian rhythm. So that's also correlates with the clinical phenotype. So one thing that is really annoying for the parents is that these Prada Villi kids, they don't have circadian rhythm. So they don't have night, night and day and sleep during the day and are awake uh, during the night. So this is the Overall biological pictures so of these CD box snow RNAs, they form methylating snow RNAs that methylate uh, RNAs in the nucleus. And they also form non methylating snow RNAs uh, that perform functions in uh, alternative splicing. Uh, they can activate enzymes like, uh, um, uh, like an, uh, the protein kinase R that, uh, that uh, is, 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 is activated by double stranded RNA. And what I showed you here, they can regulate the stability of messenger RNA. It's not clear to me, um, it's difficult to figure out whether this occurs in the cytosol. It's possible, but it can also uh, occur prior to export of the messenger RNA in the cytosol. So we don't know where this RNA is destabilized. And this brings me to the last slide uh, of the presentation, uh, because this is the Department of Nutritional Sciences here. Uh, what we found is basically that RNA stability, or a change or a deregulation of the normal RNA stability contributes or generates obesity. Now, RNA, st RNA stability is regulated by uh, modifications, uh, most notably here the uh, N6-methyl adenosine that is shown here. If you have this A here methylated, in general, this makes RNA less stable it's, it's, if it's in the 3' uh, UTR. Uh, so this is one of the most common RNA modifications. As I said, uh, it's um, concentrated uh, in the UTR. And putting this for putting this methyl group here on, at the end of the day, you need folic acid that goes via uh, s uh, adenosyl methionine. Uh, that adds these uh, methyl groups here. And there's actually, in the literature, there's quite a, um, uh, quite a, 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 uh, there's quite a lot of reports about uh, a connection between folate concentration and obesity, especially in children. And that's very similar to our system because you have a modification that changes RNA stability that has an has a obesity phenotype. And what is completely underestimated is a change of 6-methyl uh, uh, RNA on non-coding RNA. So for here, for the students in the audience, this is a direct link between folic acid that you eat in forms of uh, how is it called fortified uh, uh, corn or fortified, fortified starch or folic acid pills or ve even vegetables uh, and the readout on, uh, on your RNA stability that might lead to a phenotype. With this, I thank you for your attention and my collaborators and funding. Awesome. I hope there are questions. Looks like there are. Yeah, I, I wonder whether you, uh, do animals eat, uh, or whatever, uh, or individuals that have these symptoms, do they eat 24 hours, or they eat only during the day and they don't eat during the night? So what I know from patients, I mean, it's hard to say because they are highly restricted. I mean, the treatment of Prada I forgot to say, is you give them growth hormone and you put them, I mean, people called me this in a, I shouldn't say it with my German accent, but people put them in a concentration camp. You literally lock up the freezer, you lock up the garbage can, 
uh, like there's no access to food. And most of them end up in foster home situations where they, uh, you know, the food is completely controlled. If you let them, yeah, I would think they would eat, so tend to eat. The to the right, the circadian rhythm is like this. Most parents, they complain about two things. So there's these tantra tantrums around food. That's horrible, like uh, drama every day. Secondly, you cannot sleep through the night because they're up. They can't sleep all night. Yeah. They're, they're, well, I, the, the, Sam, the, girl, the person there, we were <laughs> in a pizza place in Manhattan with the parents after, especially after a meal when they, uh, when I think insulin goes up, he goes head down into the pizza leftover because he falls asleep, like on the table. So this is called, what's nap nacrolepsy or something? Yeah. yeah. So they have this, and it's, yeah, severe. Yeah. It could be related to the uh, BCSK1 processing defect, right? Like it's processing. I have never seen this before, and I found this pretty impressive. It's Mm -hmm. um, so first is um, related to the stability, and how is that selectivity, I mean, like how is that taken by your cells, actually? Uh, you know, oh, th this is, and, yeah. yeah. And, um, and if the patient receives this oligo-5 as, as therapeutics, that means that the patient's going to be continuously needing this, right? Uh, right. To, to so... The, the oligo-5 development that came from the SMA field, spinal muscular atrophy, and spinal muscular atrophy is basically, you can cure spinal muscular atrophy if you change splicing of, of a gene called SMN2. Mm -hmm. And we showed this in 1999 that you can do it by overexpressing a protein factor. And then other people picked it up and they used an oligo. And they used, this is Isis Pharmaceuticals, and then no longer called Isis, they're called something else. Um, so they developed two prime or phosphothioates and it's uh, and two, two prime or methyl phosphothioates and then actually it's now a two prime ethyl phosphothioate. The oligo is rock stable and every neuron will take up these oligos for unknown reasons. So this is the the modification it's FDA approved since 2016 it's called nusiserin. It's injected once every three months into the spinal fluid, and then it penetrates the neurons and stays there long enough for the, I mean, this just started. I mean, there was one of the, the clinical trials where the FDA pulled the, they had a control group and the efficacy group, and they pulled the control group up because the control group was going down and it was working, so. So the, this is, there's similar oligos for dystrophin, and we follow this thing. What is new here, Another twist, so I told to the ISIS guys, this is the oligo, they didn't believe me that this thing crosses the blood-brain barrier. And I think it's because it interacts with the serotonin receptor as an RNA ligand in the choral plexus that filters it into the serotonin. Yeah. <coughs> yeah, so the canonical snow RNA, like U3, that does... Um, it, it does ribosomal, it cleaves a pre-ribosomal pre RNA, they're stable for days. I mean, it's, it's not messenger RNA. I mean, these things are stable uh, throughout the life of the cell. Uh, for other SNO RNAs, I know for SNOT115, we measure this. This fluctuates quite a bit in the hypothalamus about feeding and starving. So it depends uh, what SNO RNA, it depends in what complex they are. I believe if they are in this methylating complex with the proteins around and stuff, this stuff is stable, like a splicing, uh, spli spliceosome, right? Uh, if they are in this kind of transient uh, uh, complexes here that make, that regulate uh, messenger instability, they will be less stable. Uh -huh. 
So 115 has only one class. There's from 47 human copies, there are three that have point mutations in the antisense box. So they, there's basically, this is like one molecule. There's indistinguishable on the RNA. That's 115. 116, we can, if you just make a, 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 a diagram of, of sequence homology, they fall into six classes, and we know this because we made the oligos to knock them all out. Uh, there might be more. They're quite in, this is in humans. In, in mouse, as you showed, it's, it's different. So in, in humans, they're quite, they're, they're from the sequence, they're quite different in terms of their primary sequence. That doesn't necessarily mean because in, in RNA, a G can base pair to a, a U can base pair to a G and to an A, uh, that they don't have the same targets, but it looks like they're different molecules. Mm -hmm. And then it's just constantly changing, and maybe, I don't know, structure or something else is more important for the function. Well, what is conserved in all of them is the C and D boxes. You, you mute at them, they're gone, right? Uh, and what's conserved is that the C prime box that forms the second loop here is messed up. That's intrinsic in the system, and that's probably there's a reason for it. Uh, but the binding side, the way I think it, if you look at a... Um, evolutionary conservation plot of messenger RNA says usually the coding sequence is, is conserved outside the third vowel base and then, the, and then it drops down in the UTR but in the UTR there's always like areas that are highly conserved and this is probably what we see in the snow RNA so we have probably snow RNAs that are evolved to pick out certain UTRs and one thing we also drove it down in, the, in this PNAS paper we looked for the evolutionary conservation for SNOR 27 splicing targets, and they're not conserved, which is an interesting thing because um, are there computer scientists here? So the, the holy grail of computer scientists, they, they look for evolutionary conservation. If something is conserved, it's important. That's, in, in a nutshell, that's the argument. What we see with the SNOW RNA is actually they're not conserved. And it might simply reflect our, our current ignorance about the, the binding sites. It's possible that UTRs evolve and then the snow RNAs evolve in the same way. But we don't understand the targets. We might not see it. Same for microRNAs. I mean, microRNAs is functional if it's evolutionarily conserved. I think that's a circular argument. Yeah. Do you ever, uh, 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 there's really just nothing else no, that we, we regulate, well, we haven't found it yet. So we looked, I mean, I spent a whole hour one looking for target genes. And yeah. so we basically found, by bioinformatic analysis and doing RT-PCRs, we found other splicing things, which are not as dramatic as a serotonin receptor. So there might be other sidekicks to it. What we found by overexpressing copies, that SNORT-115 works together with SNORT-116. So they seem to, in ways that I don't understand, they seem to modify each other. It could be that they compete for processing factors or that they actually that the RNA bind together by forming CD box dimers. They're set up for this. Problem is not one of five. There's no single cell line. So I cannot knock it out in a cell transiently, looks what's going on. And uh, I... Well, as a biochemist, I believe cell knockouts more than I believe mouse knockouts because I don't have these adaptation things. So this is the only, this seems to be the physiological most relevant uh, thing. And we can alleviate the most severe phenotype by an oligo that mimics one of the five. That goes over the serotonin receptor. Yes? Mm -hmm. And uh, you show that the, the mutation of SNOW RB116 
seats where we have to delay the uh, degradation of uh, C4 MRI. Uh, so there are more than 200 uh, snow on it and uh, more than 10 millimeter on the trees. How do you kind of just uh, this specific uh, association? Oh, yeah. So there's 257 snow RNAs and immediate early genes, I don't know how many are, but more than 200. So it's, I think it's, it's quite a lot that are, uh, that are analyzed. So this is, a, this is a working hypothesis. So we, when, we, when I looked at the, I mean, when we got this gene list, the first thing I looked at, um, like how many T's, how many, you know, triple T's and whatever are in, in these genes. And what you find is this A-rich sequences that's really popping out. And that's the hallmark of destabilized messenger RNAs. So these are highly enriched in our, uh, in our genes. That, by the way, it doesn't pop up when you look in, in David or something. You have to really look for it. This is where this working hypothesis comes from. Secondly, yeah, this is just my, I, I guess it's a personal bias. We zoomed in on one RNA where we can regulate the stability. So I, I'm, I cannot rule out that these things do other things, that the snow RNAs do other things, but this is one thing that's not one of the six doing. So, I mean, you, you're right in this point. That's, yeah. we, we're pushing one model. Yeah. Well, thank, you very thank you. Much.